Hi, this is Simon Bamford holding on to his head with both hands. You're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. Excellent. That sounds filthy as well. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of braggadocious. He's like, with both hands. I mean, <laughs> hey, you, one has to big oneself up. <laughs> Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neil. And I'm Mama Creepy. Mm hmm. And we're joined by. Oh, you give, give yourself a. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think I probably did this last time as well, but I, I just liked the rhythm of it. And, mm -hmm. and I'm Nicholas Vince, he says very sheepishly. <laughs> right, right. And, and I just totally just destroyed all the rhythm of it. I, I, no, 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 that was me. That was definitely me. <laughs> Hi, Neil. Hi, Mama Creepy. Hi, welcome. Hey. Welcome, Nicholas. Yeah, I believe this is... You've been on many times. I, I think you're nearing the record. I think oh, no, John, I, John Dugan still has the record, but I think you're getting close. What, what's his record? He says like 10 appearances, I believe. Oh, I'm nowhere close. I'm only about four. I think yeah, this I think is my fun. fourth, I think... Uh -huh. Maybe I, five. I know I, I've listened to you at least two other times. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's just my memory, really. <laughs> 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 yeah, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, before we go any further, mm -hmm. I just want to give a quick shout out to somebody, if I may. Um, and that is a young lady who I believe uh, may have dressed up as a certain Cenobite, um, uh, probably this past Halloween, and her name is uh, Lyric. Lyric, um, I just wanted to say thank you very much. It's always nice to meet young people who appreciate our work. Um, and uh, lots of love and best wishes to you. And just remember to keep on chattering. <laughs> it's very nice of you. That's, That's so fun. sweet. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I, mm. no, real mm. quick uh, about that. Um, what age range do you find uh, are like uh, fans of Hellraiser? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I think because what you have to understand is the laws on who can see. Okay, there's two ways of looking at it. Mm -hmm. You know, when we made this film. It was 18, we were making it in the UK with the expectation that only people over 18 years of age would be able to see it. Because in the UK, it, you know, it doesn't matter who you're with, you had to be 18 years old. But as I understand it in the States, you could go and see more or less anything, anything as long as you've got an adult with you. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Unless yeah. it's NC-17, when it's R, R is... Um restricted but you could go with uh, with a parent nc-17 which wasn't around at that time uh even with a parent you wouldn't be able to see it until you're 17 well, i think back then when it came out i don't think we even had to have a parent come with us it was pretty flexible i think well, i think by the law you had to but uh but but most i, really? I never was yeah i was never no one ever said any body law breakers yeah, no one ever, no one ever said anything to me about seeing R-rated movies. Oh yeah. wow! Wow, my yeah, parents so... always let us watch whatever R-rated movies at home and stuff. So it was never. I I grew up on horror movies, so yeah. Yes. It was oh, never oh, a oh, hard oh. thing for me. Yeah. yeah. So, so in the UK, obviously, you know, for a long time there were there was a certain age limit involved. But when I first started going to the States, I was amazed at how young people were. And I still meet, and you know, just like Lyric, you, there are still people. We seem to be getting new generations of fans, basically, mm -hmm. which I adore. I, you know, after 30 years, this is a real testament to Clive's vision um, and, you know, the hard work of everyone involved. But, um, yeah, we, I, you know, I meet all sorts. I meet all ages. A lot of teenagers uh, we do meet quite a lot of teenagers. I, I guess at conventions, it tends to be more people who are in their thirties and so on and, and mm -hmm. upwards. And that's probably, to be honest, mostly because they're the ones who can afford to go around and you know <laughs> right, buy right. autographs and so. On. <laughs> so you've got yeah. So you don't you know. But we do meet you know we do meet young people in their early twenties and so on. And and families bring their kids around. Um, 
who seem to be absolutely fascinated by all these weird and wonderful people. And I think that's really cool. Um, mm-hmm. that kids, you know, uh, get to see them. So yeah, it's all ages, all ages. Mm-hmm. I always think it's interesting to, you know, what movies like can do that. Uh, they can always find new audiences, you know, every generation, mm. is, is, even if, you know, they didn't grow up with it, they, they, uh, they're attracted to it. And then some movies, you know, are kind of lost uh, with only the generation that, that, you know, watched it to begin with. And then some, some things are timeless. Yeah, it, it's interesting. And, I, and again, I guess, and obviously you get different as you grow older. I realize that basically you have different styles of films. I mean, when I grew up, I grew up on, so I'm talking about the 1960s. On Sunday afternoons, on you know, in the days when we only had two t- TV channels in mm-hmm. the United Kingdom, uh, they used to show either war films or black and white Hollywood movies. So we got all the Bette Davis and so on. But basically, that was the staple. You know, that's those were the sort of movies. Unless you went to the cinema. <laughs> Lawnmower man. Yes, it is the lawnmower man. I was hoping it wouldn't come through, but it's see, coming through. Needle has a currently uh, hot, sweaty, shirtless lawnmower boy <laughs> over at his cold. house right no, now. It's pretty cold outside, so I doubt it, he's true. been he's been taunting all about it. I'm like. Like, don't you have snow yet? I'm like, send him down south to my yard and let him mow my lawn. I'm trying to block it out, but I'm not sure if it's working. No, well, we'll 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 just reiterate if we go. It's great. You know, it sounds as if someone's taking off your head, Neil. Uh, Uh (laughs) You know, that's uh, what we talking about before that happened. I can't remember. Uh, about uh, about what uh, uh, stuff you're watching black on TV. and white TV. Yeah. Oh yeah, black and white. So uh, you know, yeah. that's that. You, you're talking about th- yeah, things getting lost. So I mean, it's I guess there are class. You know, there are things like Casablanca. Uh, you know, whole. You know, the styles of movies um, that will just never go out of fashion because they're just damn good filmmaking, and you know, you can learn an awful lot from from those. But I think what's also changed, of course, is that we're now exposed to so many more different genres and foreign films. I just sat down and watched the other day three films from Japan, um, Genshin Ryokoran, uh, I think is the name, um, uh, basically about a, a samurai. And it's three films and I, I watched. They're brilliant. Absolutely superb. Um, and you can see where um, Quentin Tarantino's influences came from for Kill Bill. Um, so I think, you know, although we do lose some things, you know, the, the sea of media that you can actually choose from is now so much wider. Um, so it swings and roundabouts, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. We, actually, we, we talked a couple um, shows ago, we talked about the difference between like, Japanese movie, Korean movies, um, like Thai movies from Thailand, and the differences in between them and stuff. Um, but yeah, you get into the different genres too, and you really see some different things, like um, the Wild West movies and and things like that. And they're just great. Mm. Yeah, I, I love international movies. Love them. They're so great, especially like. Um, the uh, spaghetti westerns. I love spaghetti westerns. Those are always so much fun. Oh, interesting. I, okay, I guess those are foreign. I see. When I think of foreign movies, I always think of foreign language movies. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, but I, I you know, but yeah, I, I get that. You know, spaghetti. Yeah. You know, you're, you're thinking of um, the uh, fistful of dollar dollars and. Well, talking more about like. Um, Say a Japanese movie, you can look at something okay. like uh, where it, it may not be necessarily like an actual Western, but it has a Western flavor to it in a horror yeah. movie where there's a good guy that might actually kind of a bad guy, but he's still going after the real bad guys, you know, and that relates a lot to a Western movie. 
you know. Um, well, I, I mean, the classic is the the classic, of course, is the remake of Seven Samurai. Um, mm-hmm. And I've forgotten the name. Seven Samurai is remade as. Uh, Magnificent, Magnificent Seven. seven. Magnificent yeah. Seven. <laughs> I knew there was yeah. seven in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, I just saw I mean, that for the first time. That was yeah. really good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's one of my uh, one of my brother's favorites is uh, the Seven Samurai, the original one. Yeah. yeah. So you're a very busy man lately. You've got a lot of a lot of stuff out here, and uh, and uh, we'll, we'll want to talk about all of them if, if possible if we have time. Yeah. We'll but uh, uh, the night whispered is one that that's I assume would be very uh, uh, important to you since uh, you you saw it from uh, you know, you wrote it directed it now it's you know you have it coming out so what is that whole experience like from uh, from writing it to seeing it you know actually out that people can can watch it it's 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 really fascinating because it is literally nearly two and a half years we filmed it on november 22nd and 21st two years ago uh and obviously there was a good you know there was at least oh my gosh i've no idea how long it is must have been the middle of the year it's probably summer so it is yeah it's about two and a half years it's quite fascinating as far as i'm concerned because i kind of thought that it had come to the end of its festival run um which it had and then suddenly i got invited to screen it at a couple of places including our local cinema club uh in front of the movie get out oh that's pretty well that was great i just saw that too (laughs) yeah it's wonderful isn't it and and Mm -hmm. what what was it totally wanted it went away i didn't think it was gonna go and i was like wow yeah that's different I, i really liked it yeah, I mean, because it was done as part of our local film club, because um, I'd submitted The Night Whispered to them over a year previously when they were doing evenings specifically for local filmmakers. And then they stopped doing that. And then they did, but I just got this message through saying, can we screen before Get Out? And we're going to be doing a and a afterwards about Get Out would you like to come along and talk a little bit about Night Whispered? So it was great because we talked about Get Out, but then I was able to actually sit with an audience who'd just seen the Night Whispered and mm-hmm. talk about that as well. And it was great because it was the, you know, it was the local film club. So a lot of people recognized where it was filmed. Um, so, and I thought, actually, there's there's more to this movie than because I'd originally just assumed I was going to put it out. In fact, the original plan was I'd just put it out on Vimeo or or YouTube mm-hmm. um, and and just let it for free. And I thought, you know what? No, I'm actually, you know, we put a lot of work into this. Um, I'm going to put it out for sale. You know, r- really reasonably. Um, mm-hmm. And I and I'd already promised it as a reward as part of the Kickstarter, which I'd done earlier on, you know, did earlier on this year for my next two short films, Your Appraisal and Necessary Evils. So it's been, I've been re- a I've been really pleased. Uh, I've been watching the IMDb score slowly creep up from six, and then to six point five, and it was seven point five this morning. No, uh, <laughs> it's like wow, that's extraordinary. Um, which I think puts it on a par with Hellraiser in terms of IMDb score. Um, but, you know, which is amazing. That's kind of how I judge all IMDb scores: is it as good as Hellraiser? Yeah. So I could, you know, handle you know whether or not it stays there or not, because obviously these things fluctuate uh, depending on how many you know who sees it, what sort of review. But people have been really positive about it because it's just. It's a nice little chiller, um, uh, and so on. So yeah, it 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 was kind of a surprise, and but I'm really pleased that I you know I put in the extra effort um, mm-hmm. to kind of get it. It on was much. really it was really great. I really enjoyed watching it. I was like, is there gonna be more? Oh, I want more! I want more! And <laughs> I I love I love finding short because I mean there are short movies that I see where I'm like, okay, that was it, wrapped it up perfect in a little package and then i see certain shorts where i'm like come on give me a little more give me a little more yeah a little more and this was definitely one of those where i was like 
oh my god, it was so good. I want more. <laughs> so, it, it, it was great. I, I really did enjoy it. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Mama. Yeah. I, it's the yeah I, I i mean that is always the trick of the short you always want to make people leave people wanting more. you should always leave people mm-hmm. wanting you know, yeah or it's the old adage whenever you're doing plays right you know any kind of writing uh leave people and i do like the sort of film where it isn't all totally explained it's yeah i was yeah. going to bring that up because i think mm-hmm. it was it's hard to do in a short to leave the the ending up for interpretation I think it would be easier to do in a longer uh, uh, format, but I don't know. In my mind, I think it would be harder to do in, in a, you know, an eight minute short. Yeah. I mean, and it, it's a, well, funny enough, of course, eight minutes is interesting as well because a minute is the title sequence at the beginning. And I think it's about 45 right. seconds of the, but the title sequence at the beginning, I was really clear that I wanted that title sequence at the beginning um, to set up the whole thing, to set up the park where we screen, you know, where it's all filmed, give you an idea that, you know, that I think everything is getting darker. Um, I talk about this in the, in the making of documentary, which I, I, that has been the other challenge of the last few weeks, getting a making of documentary together, um, which is longer than the film itself. It runs it. You know, <laughs> <Right. so. laughs> <laughs> of course, of course it is. It's uh, like the film itself. Um, there was so much to talk about. Um, you know, the whole film is about a journey from light into darkness, and you're move, you're constantly moving from light into dark, darkness. I mean, it, effectively, they move from dark into light, and then from light into darkness, and they seem to constantly choose this this way of make it. In some way, they choose to walk into the dark um so yeah it but i think in terms of leaving people wanting more i think it i don't like things which are absolutely explained because you think it's like oh okay it, it was that mm. but if you don't fully if you don't fully explain then it kind of leaves people in their imagination then they start writing the story yeah. themselves and i to me that's that's the joy of the short form um, mm-hmm. If you don't answer it, you, know, you shouldn't answer every question because it's just kind of like handing everything. You want people to think about your work afterwards and, you know, think about it, come up with their own explanations as to why things ha- happen and, and so on. So, yeah. Uh, it yeah, and sometimes. Had me thinking and it definitely had me creeped out. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, a lot of times, <laughs> what's in your imagination, uh, you know? maybe can't be filmed or mm. everyone has something different, which is more personal to them or creeper to them or whatever to them. Yeah. And, uh, and then, the, you know, instead of just your own, uh, definite, like this is what's happening. Uh, yeah. it's, 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 to me, it's more fun to, to think about. And, uh, you can talk about with people who watched it and everyone come to their own conclusion. Yeah. I, I think that that's the sort of thing, isn't it? The, the fact that, you know, if you've gone to see a movie, if everything's handed to you on a plate, there's nothing to talk about with your mates afterwards and just saying, oh, no, it was about this or, what, you know, it was about that. Or, you know, that's not that is a sweeping generalization because mm-hmm. obviously many, you know, fully rounded stories also inspire debate. But um, I think it does kind of lead to those kind of interesting discussions um, as to where it is. But I, it's it was a fun movie to make. It was no, and what am I talking about? It was cold. It was inc- really incredibly cold. <laughs> okay. that, that, that's why the making of documentary is called Bloody Hell, It's Cold. Because, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it really was zero degrees uh, oh. Celsius the night that of the film. Thing. Yeah, so when you see... Oh, go Sorry, ahead. I was going to say... No, 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 go ahead. Um, the... Uh, so when you see the breath frosting when mm-hmm. they're standing at the tram stop, mm-hmm. that's because we were filming at two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and it was geez, it was so cold, um, and it, 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 fortunately we didn't have to keep Bertie out um, in, in, in the in the war. You know, we had you know we had blankets and so on. And, yeah. 
uh, you know, we made sure he was really, really warm all the time. <laughs> but Bertie uh-huh. got a lot of attention, you know, lots of hugs. Uh, uh-huh. actually, um, <laughs> yeah. so has, it gone, has it gone to its head? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, he's always a drama <laughs> uh, Trust me, he's a drama queen. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, he's, he wants a Winnie Bago on the next time we use him. Uh, <laughs> um, one quick question I had was um, with The Night Whisper, now you did all the filming at night, and one thing I really noticed was, like, you shot a lot at the sky, how clear it was, and the full moon. Now, I know, like, a lot of people would just do CGI or or what have you, but um, did you guys actually wait for a night that would be perfect for the shooting? Or did you go in for the CGI, for the clearer sky and the, the big full moon the for big shooting? Full- the full moon itself is CGI um, okay. because you you can't. Uh, the thing about waiting it's so for the, hard, yeah, yeah, and also what you, of course you can't wait for the perfect night because mm-hmm. you you have to plan at least you know you you have to schedule the day that you're actually going to do your filming because you have to know that to get the insurance to get the permissions to actually mm-hmm. film. So we filmed in a local country park. Well, that meant I had to approach. I had to get the uh, filming rights uh, for, with the local council um, sorted away and so on. So we were just lucky that it was, I mean, as I say, it was, funnily enough, it was warm the night, the week before. It was warm the week after but for November. But that night it dropped to zero. So it, you know, they were clear skies. Our real problem was fireworks. Um, because we had the, you know, we, we, we have this tradition at the beginning of November, you have firework displays. Um, but I have no idea what they were doing, having fireworks displays at the end of November, but they did, um, uh, that <laughs> night. But, but it's, and it, it's all part of the atmosphere. And uh, one of the, one of the nice reviews that I saw on, um, IMDb, uh, was was talking about the fact that we managed to film so well in night in the night. There is one shot that is really grainy, one of the long long shots, which we could, is really noisy, um, and there's nothing we could do about that. But otherwise, I was just really fortunate that our uh, director of photography, Matt Camlin, knew his stuff um, and was able to light everybody so well. Oh, that's the other piece of CGI, of course, is that at the beginning you see two lamps. Um, mm-hmm. those don't exist um, but I just wanted to because we had to have lamps to film by I thought well I've got to be able to explain that source of light because it always annoys me if you you know people are running through a dark forest that's amazingly well lit um, <laughs> <laughs> you know with no explainable light source um, and that always you know that always takes me right out of it when I see things like that I, I I want there to be lights. If there's light on screen, you should know where it comes from. If it's to, and I think you know all these things. You know, the night whisper particularly. I filmed it as naturalistically. We played it as naturalistically as possible, and that I think is part of its strength. You know, that's what's kind of creepy about it is because this could happen to anybody. Um, I remember I think it was either Jen or Sylvia. Uh, Soska saying you know, what they really liked about it was these people don't know they're in a horror movie that you know it could mm-hmm. you know they're just wanting to get home and they're going to take a shortcut across the dark and scary country park yeah. um, you know it's it, there's no there's no oh we mustn't walk that way because there's you know because of the legend Right. <laughs> which is fine I, you know I get you know that's sure that, you know I, I just watched a really interesting film called Red Barn um, the other day and I can't for the life of me remember who directed that uh, it was one of these I was judging for the Dead of Night film festival recently uh, and it was my favourite and you know and again it's it's that thing of there's the legend you don't do this and mm-hmm. And so, of course, everybody goes off and does it because, 
Uh, or, else it, or else there'd be no movie. But, or else there'd be no movie. But that's what <laughs> I really wanted to avoid. You know, not you know, I just wanted to do something differently with the Night Whisper. I didn't want yeah. there to be the legend, which you you know, or sure. I didn't want it to be the thing you mustn't do, and then you go off and do it. That gave me a good idea for my own uh, short. It's going to be the legend of whatever, and it's like whatever you do, don't do this, and then they just don't do it, and then it ends. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you must have seen it. There's the lovely. Um, uh, it's a lovely skit. It's a YouTube video. You know, it's the sensible horror movie where they, <laughs> no. where they, yeah, where they, go they down they, in the basement. Yeah, there so they go, go, go down. down yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> I'll be right back. Yeah, <laughs> don't go into a scary cabin. Yeah, no, you're right. It's yeah, horrible. Let's go yeah. to the booth. Yeah, don't yeah. go out to a scary cabin in the woods. Hey, yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah. It's like, make sure your car had a tune-up before you left. Come on now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, I get all, all those things. Yeah. Uh, did, did you... Did, her, I think it all... Oh. That's okay, go on. I, I, I think that uh, the nice whisper with uh, the CGI and the sky and everything, I think it blended really well. I mean, I really did. I was like... Did they actually pick a night, find a night that it actually worked out just perfect, or was it CGI? It just really blended perfectly, and that sky was just gearing enough to give it that help, give it that feel, that intensity. So I thought it, I thought it was just great to add that to the intensity to the situation, Thank what you. was going on. Thank you. Did you do your own editing? No, I worked with a gentleman called David Malcolm, uh, who's based up in Scotland. Um, funnily enough, as is my our composer, Patrick Fagan. Um, so we basically had to do... So we sent all... So I sent a uh, recorded delivery, obviously, um, a drive with all the footage on to David. And then he, he kind of gave me a rough edit. Uh, and then I created an Excel spread. Um, with a you know, with timings down the left hand side, what was happening in each, at each shot. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'd chosen. I'd already. I did do a kind of circle. You know what we refer to as circled take. So basically, assuming there's more than one take of a particular shot, you go through and decide which one of those you think works best, um, and then he put together a rough assembly. Uh, and then when I looked at that, and then I just went back to my Excel spread and then made all my notes and saying, okay, I think this needs to be shorter. Or can we try this? You know, can we try this shot? Or this isn't working. Or, you know, there's somebody, uh, they haven't, you know, it, it's the it's the usual classic thing. It's only when you look at it really closely, you realize that somebody had looked at the camera Um mm. I mean, you know, there all sorts of things happen on, and it's really funny. I, do you remember there was one note um, on? There was one moment during the filming where um, it's at the very, it's at the very beginning where Ed says, "Come on, Rachel," um, and we shot that bit, and, and everyone said, "Great, moving on." I said, "No, no, we're gonna have to redo that." Dawson said, "Come on, Laura," which was the actress's name. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody else had spotted it. Nobody right. else had spotted it. Um, yeah. So that yeah, there are always things that go on. Um, Those little that. things. Yeah, yeah. So it was really interesting, you know, working backwards and forward. You know, it, took, it takes longer doing that. Ideally, I mean, when I did um, your appraisal and necessary evils, uh, then I was able to sit down with the editor, literally, um, side by side, and make editing decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so on but it's it, it's in some which was good you know in terms of speed but in terms of giving yourself enough time to do things i like the fact that it, it although it, it was frustrating at the time i think oh god it's going to take forever if we're doing it this way but it does mean that you can have a chance to really get to know the footage um and and make really get to understand which are the best shots and the way it can hang together and, and what's working and what's not doing. But yeah, David, I was very lucky with David Malcolm, yeah. who's a great editor. You, He's also a filmmaker you, himself. Do you have any problem um, with editing your own, your own footage? Because 
I just think me personally, like uh, sometimes it would be hard to edit something that uh, maybe I had like a, a good time, like a good ex- memory of doing, but yet it maybe doesn't fit into the to the finished project. That's interesting as well. I mean, obviously, I I I mean, when we were working on the Night Whispered, I had to keep on looking at my own performance um, and go really bored with that and just thinking oh god I'm <laughs> terrible just, it took me a while you know it really is it took a while and then obviously you know I've got you more used to it since then because I've, uh, I've mm-hmm. occasionally had to edit chattering shows or uh, sure. uh, when I was doing the night when I was doing the making of documentary mm-hmm. um we uh, I you know I recorded stuff to camera and was like okay no that's not working okay I, I can just reshoot this now and because it's just me talking to the camera in the study um but it's yeah it, it's always tough looking at yourself i think you're you're so high I've, I've kind of got used to it that i can kind of zone out and just think i, I always just criticize my beard i always just <laughs> whatever it is i'm doing i just criticize the beard i think oh god should have combed that or that there's a stray hair there you just want to walk up to the screen and cut yeah. it the stretch <laughs> you always find something that uh, you're gonna, you know really just yeah I, I, can never, I can never i can never edit myself in a movie and act in a movie i can do it i get done with the show and as soon as it's up i listen to it so i can like criticize myself i'm like oh i can talk a little differently here or do this or whatever yeah no i, I couldn't do both <laughs> well, I, I mean <laughs> i have said no if i'm going about it I mean, I'm not going to do uh, acting and directing again. Um, I'll do yeah. directing. I'll do writing and directing. But I've no plans to write and direct myself uh, again. Yeah. It's just too much stress. It's just, too, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of, it's a different part of your brain that's in, engaged, really. And I think they're both, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know. So I read the, the, I'm immediately reminded of one point. Uh, there's a shot where you first see me in the night whispered, where I'm looking really stern and frightening. Well, that's me waiting for the camp for action. <laughs> <laughs> that's not after action. That's just me before action, waiting for. <laughs> uh, we're, you know, we're rolling sound and camera. Here's my best acting when I'm not acting. Yeah, it's my best. Well, these, and I know there are certain directors who just, you know, will tell the DP to keep on rolling after they say cut, mm-hmm. just because the actors will relax and and, and slightly more because, you know, that that's is that classic thing of you know, do you say action or do you just say or when you're ready uh, as a director? Um, Clint Eastwood has always said he always says when everyone's ready mm-hmm. uh, because it means that you're going into it Other, some actors like that some some don't some you know like that little jolt of bring brings up their energy um but it just depends on the piece uh, uh, and what it is you're doing yeah so i know last time uh when, when i had you on you talked about like what to do with the shorts like once they're done and you kind of talked about this about you thought about me just putting on Vimeo or YouTube and people watch it for free since you, since then, since you started, you know, uh, filming this and now that it's out, has, has that changed at all? Do you think it's people are more open to, um, to paying for shorts or to, are there new places, you know, for shorts to be seen? Yeah. I think, I mean, I'm using real house. There was a, there's a Facebook group, um, for indie filmmakers, um, about, talking about distribution because it's hard because mm-hmm. you know you to get your film distributed you you know that basically the story is you sell your film to a sales agent they never pay you you never see you never see any money um or they made they may you pay a little bit up front um and so i think people are i mean to watch to, for the whole night whispered the night whispered whispered with extras which is a total of about 30 odd minutes. Um, that's two dollars ninety nine. Mm-hmm. Now I don't think that that's unreasonable because I mean you get the making of documentary. You know you get the making of documentary. You get the previs that I did. 
Um, you get me talking about, you know, which apps, etc. You know, so there's a lot of material there. And I think two dollars ninety nine, and people, and if people don't want to pay that, it's two forty nine just to buy the movie, and I think it's one ninety nine to rent it. Um, so there are lots of pi- you know, price breaks, but I think for two dollars ninety nine, it's not an unreasonable thing to ask for thirty minutes. Um, Definitely not. And Thank I think. You for you know, the Cheaper than, sorry, cheaper than what, Mama? Cheaper than Amazon. Cheaper than Amazon. Yeah, well, yeah, funnily enough, on, I think the shorts on iTunes are £1.99, yeah. um, which is kind of, is, 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 but then that's just for the short film itself. That's not for any extras, uh, which you can't really put on. The reason I went for Real House, as I, I mentioned this group, was, oh, there's your friend. Yeah, no, I, it's not. It's not the biggest lawn here. I don't. I don't know what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> he's going over it again and again to make sure it goes down oh, to yeah. ground level. Um, like hi, Neil. <laughs> I think it's the you know, the real house is where you, you'll find the night whispered. R E E L H O U S real house. Um, and they've got a decent a decent deal because um, I mean Amazon want to take fifty percent of anything you earn. Uh, Real House is much better. Uh, I can't remember the exact numbers off my head. I mean, there's a minimum charge of fifty cents plus like five percent or ten percent. I think on mm. top. Yeah, I'm a member so, on Real House. Yeah, I really like it. It's it's totally worth it. Yeah, it's absolutely worth every every little bit. I love. Yeah, that. so I'm. Not, I mean, there's no way I'm going to make back, you know, based on the the sales so far. My John got all my press releases out yet, but um, that's another thing I need to be getting on with. Um, I'm not expecting to make the money back, but I think it is that principle of this is valuable. You know, the, the, this is valuable. Therefore, you should hand over some, you know, uh, even if it's a token fee for it, um, because. Hey, if I ever make a profit on this, then I can start paying it out to the casting crew. Um, we're a long way away from that, um, and I really, seriously, don't expect to make the money back on that. But it is—it's that principle, and just to keep people's mind. And also, I think by putting it onto Real House, there are people who are members of Real House. It may appear in their life. Obviously, if you really want to make, get a big audience, then it's Amazon. Um, because there's a lot more exposure then, but you know, as I say, it it kind of doesn't make financial sense in terms of Amazon, um, and there's a lot more hoops you have to go through to get onto Amazon. Mm-hmm. And what um, what film festivals have you have you put it out in? <laughs> um, Night Whispered. Um, oh gosh, it's so long ago now because it's over a year ago since the uh, went out. Really. <laughs> They're all on the poster. <laughs> <laughs> spooky Empire. It, it, it played at Spooky Empire, uh, thanks to Blair Brathery. Um, he, he got uh, Spooky Empire. I see. I'm going to embarrass myself now. I'm, I'm desperately <laughs> looking for the poster so I can actually. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Actually, I've got a better thing. I can. I can actually bring <clears> up. <throat> if I bring up my. Oh, okay. So where did it play? It played Macabre Fair in New York, uh, Night Piece in Edinburgh. Uh, Slash and Bash, can't remember where Slash and Bash is. It, it, it played Spooky Empire. Uh, it played uh, London Horror Society, Nova Knights, uh, Stanley's Film Club, and Corsair Corps in France, which was really lovely because they flew me out there t- for the screening. Um, this, uh, this is amazing. They threw you out. The, yes. They threw you out. <laughs> yeah, they flew me out. <laughs> I was, I was, it was really good. This is all through a, a wonderful. Yeah, they. Had, I know festivals do not don't fly people out. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it's that is amazing. It's a small village in. Well, it's a small. It's a town. They call it a village in the south of France. Um, uh, I try to remember the name of the town now. That's terrible. Um, but it's uh, a fabulous town, and we all love amazing it. Amazing town, and it, and basically, uh, oh, oh, Cabrier d'Avignon. It's near d'Avignon um, in the south of France, 
And it's they call it Sino oh, I'm gonna mispronounce that bit, but basically the festival that I attended is called Corsecho, which means short is short. So basically it's a film festival devoted to short films. Uh, short documentary films. I was part of the science fiction horror strand. Um, but the whole town gets involved. So if you visit as a filmmaker, you're not put, you don't stay at a hotel, you stay in somebody's house. So oh, wow. it's, it's really, ah, oh, it's an amazing place. And the festival kind of, they've got this big, uh, the festival, which basically effectively runs all year they have a, a feature film festival um i can't remember what time in the year and then they have the short film festival but throughout the year they do educational programs uh introducing young people to filmmaking and films um Amazing. That's and it's, it's one of them is set up by the postman 24 years ago now this year it'd be 24 years ago this year um and so and in fact it must be on fairly soon because it was here this time last year we were there, i was there um so yeah it's it's wonderful it, it's I, i'd love to go i'd love to go again um it, it, it's a really good that's pro probably my favorite of the festivals and where it's green Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you just won uh, Best Screenplay at Unrestricted View Film Fest, too, for uh, the offer. I didn't. I collected the award. Um, I didn't write that <laughs> one. <laughs> but you I, were in it. I was in, in it. it. I, yeah. Yes. It was great. And again, that is another, actually, to be honest, that is another great film festival. That's the Unrestricted uh, View of London. Yeah. Um, which takes place. I watched the offer last night, and that was amazing. I I loved it. I loved <laughs> Thank it. you. It was so good. Thank you. It was so good. I, it's 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 wonderful. I mean, it's um, about fifty minutes long, uh, and they're hoping to do more. These this is from the guys who created Leviathan, the Hellraiser documentary, and they've just done it, the original yeah. it. I think they have a RoboCop one coming out. They've got RoboCop coming out. Yeah. They did Fright Night. Um, yes. Where Simon and I, Simon Bamford and Neil I were. Neil Morris and Gary, Gary Smart. That's right. Yeah, yeah, Neil Morris and Gary yeah. Smart. So Neil wrote yeah. the screenplay from a story by Gary, but they worked on it together. So yeah, they're, we, they were down for the screening on Saturday, uh, which went very well. Um, and so and it's fun. Well, I have to say, I really, I really enjoyed about it at the cast and crew screening. Um, Barbie, Simon, Barbie Wild, uh, Simon Bamford, and myself all sat next to each other, and at the end of it, and said, "I really like your death. I thought that was a very good." Death. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Okay, so while I was watching it, I, I pretty much said the same thing. I was like, "Wow, that was a really good one." Uh, that was a great yeah, one. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to give anything away. But I did like. Uh, uh, not necessarily the death of of. Uh, I don't want to give anything away. But what one of yeah, you spoilers. three really like the yeah, spoilers? Uh, I'll say Nick. It's after Nicholas dies. I like the reveal. Was my favorite mm. part of of. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. yes. I, I, it's, the ending it's was weird. great. I loved the ending too. Yeah. Like. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Like, I'm probably going to watch it again today. <laughs> oh, great. I really, I'm, it's getting lots of, uh, I mean, it's won its first award. It's I think it's in five, it's been accepted into five festivals so far. It's difficult to, to schedule because it's too long for a short film and it's too short for a feature. Mm -hmm. uh, features are usually 70, mi 70 minutes plus. Um uh, but the offer is, is is fifty minutes, and obviously, mostly, if you if you're thinking about short films, you're thinking about twenty minutes max um, mm -hmm. for for a short film. So, I think you know, as far as I understand it, basically their aim is that they want to do more of these. In fact, they will be filming another one, um, the name of which I can't remember because I keep on remembering it wrong. So I don't want to give you the wrong name. <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not in that one. They're filming that one next, but they hope to have the same gang back. Um, yeah. So uh, is the idea for it to be like a 
hopefully be like a show, like a TV show. Or... Yeah, I think that's their. They want to do. I think they've got at least six planned, and they hope you know that if they can show these, and they'll get somebody to pick it up, um, so they can get to, you know get some proper money behind it. Um, but yeah, the amazing, wonderful location. I mean, it was, I mean, the real joy of it for those of the, who are not familiar with the offer is getting to act with people who I've not acted with for well over two decades. Um, yeah, I mean, Simon obviously had done some stuff with, but Oliver Smith. Um, well, to be honest, Oliver and I never shared screen time <laughs> All right. uh, when we in either of the Hellraiser movies. Um, he was, you know, he was there. I knew who he was, um, but we didn't have any scenes together in either of the Hellraiser movies. So it's Oliver Smith, uh, Ken Cranham, obviously, uh, who, who was in Hellbound, uh, Doctor Chenard in in Hellbound. Um, we did have scenes together in in, in Hellbound, and I <laughs> deliberately I dropped into the filming of of Ken's from oh. <laughs> remembered i need to i need to chase him up he's, he's ken's doing a play in london's west end oh uh, very cool uh, heisenberg yeah. principle or uncertainty principle mm-hmm. and we're just it, trying to sort out tickets yeah so it, mm. what's cool about all that i think that brings that's going to bring people in initially like oh it's really cool to see all the mm. uh everyone from but uh besides that like it, it's a, it's really enjoyable you know it, it could be like I don't want to name any names, but I've seen movies where it might have a whole bunch of uh, of horror, uh, you know, icons, whatever. And then you watch it, and you're like, mm. but you know, this <laughs> I think it's a good way to get people in, but also it delivers. And I thought it was a great combination of both mm. a story and and like gore, where it's not just like a, it's not just something for gore hounds, but yet it's it's a really cool story. It's kind of a, a good combination of both for people yeah. who like who like a nice story. Or who like also you know cool kills, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, I, you just don't know who's next. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's the great. Yeah, and I think that's the yeah who yeah, and why and what's going to be revealed mm-hmm. about them and and so on. And it's, I think it's a great ensemble cast. We were really lucky, not with just because there's the Hellraiser guys, um, then there's the, you know the young people um, uh, as well. But Bruce who is a well-known TV actor over here. Um, He he was just such a joy to work with. He was really, really fun to work with as well. And a very challenging role because he's just a monster. Um, (laughs) You know, the, 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 (laughs) um, you know, it's, it, it really is uh, quite, you know, quite extraordinary. Bruce Jones, um, mm-hmm. he's, you know, he's a well-known G- uh, TV actor over here, so yeah, um, yeah it's um, uh, it's fun, and I, I think it's yeah. going to do very well. I'm, I'm really pleased for the guys. I'm really pleased for them. Yeah, were any of the uh, any of the cards based on any of your personalities? <laughs> 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 I'm trying to be able to, no. I'm going to deny every. I'm denying everything on principle. Um, <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> I will not be typecast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Uh, we do have a question here. I, I have a hmm. question here from uh, from a listener. Uh, he wants to know: uh, um, getting to the naked truth of your character in the Hans and Ernst uh, German author weekend classic play, Spring Awakening. That was uh, sent in by listener Simon. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you, Bamford. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay, so for those of you who don't know, um, Simon Bamford and I were at drama school together, and we did a um, a, a play called uh, Spring Awakening. Uh, really kind and uh, really kind. and it's fairly explicit sexually it's very explicit sexually um, and <laughs> I remember there were all sort of, there's a masturbation scene in it and, uh, <laughs> sounds like a great movie to me yeah 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 um, and yeah it was it was yeah there's a male rape in it come to think of it um 
yeah it's yeah it was um it was all a long time ago um, <laughs> <laughs> i remember i had a very long speech i think i had an eight minute speech in that one uh, well, that's not me dragging either that it, it, it was directed around about six or eight minutes actually about the same length as the night whispered <laughs> uh, come to think of it um it was a long it was a long bloody bloody tour um and uh, it was a page and a half it can't have been in there it wasn't eight it couldn't have been anything like that it was only a page and a half but it was a page and a half of a script i remember that much um and i always remember my mum and dad coming to see it as well <laughs> so that was <laughs> <laughs> What was their reaction? Um, they, they, they muted. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you mum's reaction to Hellraiser. Uh, oh. When she went to see Hellraiser with me, she just looked a bit at the end. And she laughed in all the right places. She got <laughs> the humour in Hellraiser. And I said, what do you think of it, mum? And she said, it's very silly, dear. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> to, uh, uh, Clive thought that was funny as well. Um, so uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> yeah. Does there, uh, actually, since I, you know, I do want to ask about Simon real quick. Is I know you guys uh, like you just mentioned that you guys um, did plays together early on, mm. and obviously went on to do Hellraiser, and now you're working together again. And uh, but throughout that time did you guys stay close or were there periods of time like you didn't really uh weren't around each other until like um maybe you started doing the uh the convention scene yeah i think i mean basically yes it was we kind of i don't know what i mean the first convention i did was 10 years and i think that was the first one that doug uh that um simon had done um and I don't think I would have seen. I mean, we obviously we did after Hellraiser, the filming of Hellraiser. I mean, we went through to doing Nightbreed. Right. So that was over a period of three. Probably, and then by the time you'd done screening, probably four years. So it would have been about a six year gap between that and the 10th anniversary of Hellraiser. And then we probably saw each other every two or three years up until about 20 and then it's been fairly regular regular over the last 10 years and and basically you know we have we have hung out in in between but mostly we see each other at conventions and then you kind of just you pick up where you dropped off last time mm -hmm. um you know it's great we it, it was really nice the last convention we did we did monster mania and it was really nice because we had a chance to just go out with doug and steph and, and barbie Simon and myself going out for dinner, um, which we hadn't been able to do. We don't always get a chance to do that, um, mm -hmm. uh, but we did on the on the Sunday. Night. It was really nice, and we just spent you know three four hours in each other's company catching up, and it was lovely. It was really nice, mm. very cool. Mm. And, uh, so you have some other uh, uh, shorts. Uh, uh, your appraisal, necessary evils. Um, yeah, um, basically. Um, your appraisal is my second short film uh mm -hmm. that's a two-hander that's out on its festival run at the moment um that i don't think it's got anything more this year and i uh, i'm taking a pause on doing submissions to festivals and waiting really for next year to kick in uh i will be resuming um i'm actually doing some re-edits uh or we've done some re-edits on it i'm we rushed to get it into Fright Fest, and that was what I realized afterwards that was a mistake. Um, so the, the the versions that have been screened so far run seven and a half minutes. There's now a six and a half minute version of it, uh, which mm. we're just finishing off. Um, mm. Because it, you know, and particularly, again, funny enough, watching it to the, to the audience. I mean, it works. It's right. I'm not. I'm not. Um, uh, massively disappointed with it. Uh, in it but i just think it could knew it could be better so um your appraisal would be going back out again um that we that we shot in ireland with celtic badger media uh paddy murphy and his gang um who did the three don'ts um and the short film called retribution which is also on real house come to think of it um which is how, how i met paddy and and the rest of the celtic badger media gang 
Um, we filmed that at the beginning of June on the Friday. So we did one film on the Friday, and then over the next two days, we did another film, which was Necessary Evils. Um, that one's, the second one uh, is for a anthology called For We Are Many, um, which comes from Laurie Brewster, who did Unkindness of Ravens and uh, recently directed. I knew there was another film I'd forgotten about, The Black Gloves. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you guys a list of saying, we must remember to talk about these, and I've just realized <laughs> The Black Gloves wasn't on it. I knew uh, there was one I was going to <laughs> it's like every time we're, when I'm going out at the moment if I'm you know, making any appearance I need to have a prompt list just to make sure that I can so anyway yes folks the film The Black Gloves is also out on its uh, um, festival run that stars Macarena Gomez um, and they, they was at the, the uh, premiere for that a couple of weekends a Halloween weekend mm -hmm. um, yeah so Laurie Brewster, who directed Unkindness of the Ravens and The Black Gloves, they're also doing a Demons anthology. So Necessary Evils will be part of that, um, assuming I actually get it finished. We're still in post-production on that. I'm just waiting for some uh, VFX and stuff to be done on that. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's almost done. Then we'll get the score done. Uh, that's really fun as well. I, they're completely and utterly different. I mean, your appraisal really is a two-hander. Um, and it starts off with a guy tied up with a chair and his boss explaining to him that he's very disappointed in his performance at work. <laughs> <laughs> it basically came about because I spent far too much time when I was working in an office looking at the things on my desk, working out how I could injure people with them. <laughs> um, and then Necessary Evils is a much bigger cast. Uh, there's eight in that cast. Um, and that was really fun to do. I mean, both of them were really fun. I mean, two, the two actors, Dawson James and Nigel Mercier, who are in your appraisal, are also in Necessary Evils uh, as well. So yeah. over three days, basically over three days, we, we shot two films. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the... Uh, go on. Oh, I know you like checking your um, IMDb uh, points there. And I just wanted to let you know that as of right now, the offer is 7.7 7 stars. That's brilliant, isn't it? Excellent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. I was like, oh, okay. well deserved. Yes. Yeah, I love <laughs> you mentioned the, uh, the re edits on, on your appraisal. Mm -hmm. um, was that um, from um, you watching it at at the festivals or the reaction from the film festivals? Can you use them as kind of a way, uh, gauge to you what you need Well, to I mean, you don't really get feedback from festivals. Actually, I did get feedback okay. from one festival. But to be honest, it was more showing it to certain other filmmakers. Mm -hmm. um, and you're just saying, yeah, it can lose a minute. And it, it's very difficult because when you're, particularly when you're working so quickly, because, I mean, we filmed it and finished it. The deadline was 1st of July, so we filmed it at the beginning of June. I think we did it in 26 days. Um, we turned it around incredibly fast. Uh, I mean, people turn short films around faster, uh, I'm sure. Um, but, by the you know, that is still really fast. And I, I mean, it was, you know, it's my fault, but I'm director, writer-director. It's all my I'm main producer. Um, I should have taken my time. And should have just said, you know, well, it's not ready. And we'll we'll wait for some. It's always a it's always a difficult. I find it very difficult. Put it that way, because you put so much time and effort into these things, and then you finished it, and you're happy with it, and then you really don't want to show it to anybody. Uh, you just want everybody to love it. Um, but I did, and then I showed, and then but the feedback that I got came in after we I'd started submitting it to festivals. Um, but that's, you know, it's, it's like, as I say, you don't normally do this. You don't normally pull something from its festival run. But it's like, no, that's the right thing to do. I want this to be the best. I and, mean, of course, this is the one I raised money for from Kickstarter. So I want the, the Kickstarters, uh, all my backers on Kickstarter, to see the best possible film uh, sure. and, and faith in it. So it was a tough, it was a hard decision to make. It was a very hard decision to make. But um, and, and having done that, then I think we've got a much better film. We're, we're going to be able to sort out some of the other technical issues that we came and 
deal with just by you know having i mean this is the great thing about filmmaking it's not the great thing it's the worst thing about filmmaking there is never enough time there is never enough money um but with this i can say okay there's no distributor involved i'm effectively i'm the distributor i've promised the kickstarter back as they can see in spring of next year which obviously mm -hmm. i want to uh, i just want to make sure it's the best possible movie that they can see you know, so they can feel you know pleased that they that they backed it yeah yeah, yeah it looks like you have uh well one movie i mean i haven't seen it but um has the borley rectory come out yet Borley Rectory is another one that's on. Uh, that's another one I'm acting in. That one's uh, out on festival. Just started its festival run. Uh, last month. Yeah, we only did the cast and crew screening. That's amazing. Have you, have you had Ashley Thorpe on your show yet? No. You should. You, he's uh, a lovely. He's a lovely guy. And Borley Rectory is a fascinating <laughs> film. Basically, it's a drama documentary. Um, if you've ever come across a documentary called Wisconsin Death Trip, um, it's very much in the style of that. Basically, it's about Borley Rectory. It was reputedly the most haunted house in Britain. And it was really famous for this. Um, it burned down in 1939. It's no, So these hauntings that went on from the late 1800s through to the 1930s um and it's a fascinating story about the people who lived there and there's a you know there's a haunted house with a a ghost nun and so on and it built the reputation of a gentleman called harry price a ghost hunter so if you think about all of the um reality ghost hunting programs you have today Mm -hmm. They kind of sprang from Borley Rectory and Harry Price because he was <coughs> he was really the original ghost hunter who mm -hmm. wrote books about this place and so on. Um, but the great thing, but the thing, what makes it remarkable? It's live action, but rotoscoped. By which I mean is the actors are real, but the rest of it was shot against green screen. Mm -hmm. uh, we had tables and we had real cups that we held when we we're doing tea but the rest of it is entirely so it's taken actually i think it's nearly four years to come oh, wow. Oh, wow. Uh, 70 minutes so literally i i mean it's it's a real marmite movie um people either love it or hate it uh i love it i just think it's i love that you just like made a marmite <laughs> sorry, sorry I, that's a very english expression i get marmite what? i i totally get what it means <laughs> well, and Mar um hopefully that um it's not marmite for me but, yeah. <laughs> but it's very it, the pace is very slow and it's all about watching what's going on on this. You know, you really have to concentrate and, and, and give yourself up and just say, okay, this is 70 minutes. It's a doc drama documentary. There's no, it's not, there, there are some scares, but it's not, because it's telling the story of a number, it's, it's telling a number of stories because it's the stories of the different people who lived at the house and what they say they observed and the effect it had on them. Um, I think it's amazing. Uh, I, I, I love it. I, I have a good friend who really didn't like it at all. Um, but I, I think it's wonderful. And it, it's, it is an amazing thing to watch. He's the one that does like Marmite, right? Yeah, yeah. I love no, but No, I don't know what his view on Marmite is. I love Marmite, personally. But Marmite is wonderful. Um, I can't I've remember. never... Uh, I just... Uh, I've just never been able to acquire a taste for it. <laughs> I've never had Marmite. I've had Vegemite, which was... Ah, uh, that's the Australian version. Right, right. Yeah, but I was yeah, told, hey, yeah. All right. I was told I tried it wrong, too. Someone sent me some in the mail, and I just took a spoonful and ate it. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, oh my God. No, but no, I was told no, no, I should no. not do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you spread yeah, it very I, thinly on hot <laughs> toast is how you yeah, eat Marmite. Yeah, very so. thinly. If I after I'm we finish this, I'm gonna make off the boat from Ireland. So oh, right. <laughs> there was there was just no hands or butts. My grandmother was gonna, you know, try and get a steam marmite. I just wasn't looking any of I, it. 
<laughs> for those who don't know, the advertising slogan is "You'll either love it or you'll hate it." Um, yeah. that's people, you know, literally, people either love Marmite or they hate it. There's there's no in between. Um, yeah. People's reaction. Yes, yeah, so I bo- apologize if I offended any of my family. <laughs> 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 But I mean, Borley Rectory is narrated by <laughs> narrated by Julian Sands. Um, it's got a British oh, actor nice. called. Yeah, he does a really, really good job. Uh-huh. Um, and it's uh, yeah, it's it. I I really recommend it. It's worth looking out for. And I think I'm going to be really. It's getting very positive reviews. Um, I, I don't know what the IMDb score for. Um, no, we should might as well as look at yeah, Borley Rector. Let's uh, look up six, Borley. Six three, six point three right now. Okay. Six point three. That's very okay. respectable. It's just starting. It's just starting. <laughs> yeah, but it's that's got. Still, I mean, that's that's, that's, that's still really 30, good. Yeah, that's and that's really like thirty four reviews, um, mm-hmm. and it was only released on the sixth of June. Um, yeah, so, that's really yeah, good. No, yeah, I think it's doing very very well. Um, right. You've got another oh. one coming out too next year, the Book of Monsters too. Yes, absolutely. Now that's going to be fun. You have just been a busy, busy man. <laughs> busy man. You've got your it's podcast. I mean, you just got so many things on your plate. It's been My great. I mean, a Book of Monsters again is something I was act- I've acted in, and I had so much fun on that. That was a really that looks really like a lot of fun. It was. It really, really was. For those who don't know, I mean, this is the one where the Kickstarter, if you supported the Kickstarter, you got to vote on the monsters, the death. The, oh, that's awesome. The, yeah. I mean, it's like I, I, I interviewed the guy on my, the guys on my show, uh, Paul and Stuart, uh, Stuart Spark and Paul Butler. And um, they, and I said, okay, so what you've done is you've got a script and you've got holes which you're just going to drop the decisions in no no what they did was it was a branching tree so depending on what got voted in then it changed the course of the movie so certain characters died off earlier rather than later depending on the, I, I think I, I mean i have no idea exactly what the, the the thing was but you know certain just depending on how people I think, yeah, I think there was one character survived slightly longer than expected. Or, you know, than he, if he had done based on, on on the choices that were made by the uh, Kickstarter backers. But the, it's just, that again is a rollicking good fun script. Um, and the part I love I, that whole idea. It's like uh, American Idol. You get to vote off somebody. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, this person's going to get killed if you know, we get so many people that donate this much money. This person's gonna go. I'm like, I love that idea. More people should do a Kickstarter like that. Yeah, so, I think it's the first time. It's definitely the first time it's been done, as far as I'm aware. Um, I've never seen that done before. I think that's a fabulous idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they've done it with stage shows, uh, mm-hmm. where basically. At half time, the audience casts a vote, and depending on the result of the vote, then the act, I, then the actors I will totally perform a different second like half. That. I mean, it's a nightmare for the actors because they've got to work, <laughs> learn more than one show. <laughs> effectively, mm-hmm. you've got to learn, basically, they've got to learn half a dozen shows, uh, or a half a dozen so you know second acts, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. or, you know, depending on how many choices there were. Um, so it's been, and there used to be adventure books where you used to, you yeah, know, choose your own adventure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah choose yeah, your that's own. That's what I, that's what I yeah. first thought of when when you mentioned it. Yeah, yeah. Or, or pick a path was one of them too. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that is, uh, that's a, that one. That one's coming out in the spring, as will. Yeah, that. I th- well, no, I'm not sure if it's spring or summer of next year. Um, but I know that they've pr- they've completed all their principal photography, so they'll. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm really looking for. I'm really I I had a I played a very nice. It was a nice role I play, um, oh. and and probably one of the most challenging and uh, roles that I've had so far. Um, wow. I mean, That's they're all challenging. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really lucky because I get to play you know all sorts of different things um, and mm-hmm. do. You know, and, and as I say, I've been cast in some really interesting projects. 
Um, and all of which, which is different. really nice. Yeah, you know, yeah. After being, you know, after being the chatterer, you weren't just kind of, okay, I'm typecast into this. Yeah, you know, and that's it. You know, I mean, mind you, I loved you in Nightbreed. Nightbreed is one of my favorite movies. Oh, oh thank you. Yeah, Nightbreed is fabulous, and oh. um, they're, I believe they're going to be making it into a TV series. Is that right, Neil? Yeah, that's what I read. Uh, yeah, I, don't know if yeah. Nick was I mean, I, I, obviously, I won't be involved, but um, yeah. <laughs> because it'll be made in the in the states, and I don't work over like um. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, well, put it this way: I'll, I should never say never. Um, nobody's approached or you know, about it, so I'm assuming. Yeah. I, I, had a, I had a serious question about mm. uh, Nightbreed. Uh, I always want to ask you, but because uh, um, there's a couple of things. I I know you mentioned before that that the character is really um, personal to you, mm. and and also I remember one of our early interviews. You talked about having a uh, reconstructive surgery mm. on your jaw. Is that the reason? That that character is so. Uh, uh, it's chatter- it chatterer is the reconstructive surgery uh, mm-hmm. rather than Kinskin Nightbreed. It's the chatterer yeah. Cenobite um, is is the one that was inspired by the reconstructive uh, surgery on my face. Um, the fact that I ended, I mean, it, I think it's ironic that I ended up because basically the reconstructive surgery I had was to correct an undershot jaw. In other words, my I had a very prominent chin. <laughs> and Kinski is really well known for his prominent chin. Um, right. Is that people have the longer my beard gets, people look at me and saying, "Yeah, Kinski, I can see that." Yeah, so I, oh, I just need a sponge on my forehead. Um, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I I I love doing Nightbreed. Nightbreed is an amazing movie, and they've just done. In fact, they've sold out really, really quickly. The um, uh, the cabal edition, cabal cut yeah. DVDs, yeah, those sold out. I think within a day or so. Um, so those have all gone. Um, yeah. Although I, I believe I'm getting a copy. I'm, I'm just glad this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know Simon was because I think Simon was. I don't see uh, anti, but uh, he was very critical of the first uh, cut of Nightbreed that came out, which <laughs> stand, you know caused problems with some people. But uh, he's also been very uh, positive on on the cabal cut because he said. You know, finally, this is the this is the movie that we made. What yeah, absolutely. I, I think well, there's the Cabal cut, but also uh, the director's cut as well. Right. I mean, because um, yeah. obviously the director's cut went back to the original footage because they found the original footage. So that's very much Clive's uh, vision because yeah. Clive oversaw the. Um, whereas Russell Charrington did. Uh, Cabal cut, director's cut is definitely Clive's cut. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the, the truth of it is, of course, because certain footage wasn't shot, and you know, you'll never get entirely what Clive had got. That mm-hmm. you, you know, if, if you look at the original script, you'll never see. That said, I think the, the director's cut is amazing, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I, you know, the Cabal cut as well. Um, there are different interpretations of the same story. I mean, the, the, the Cabal cut, Russell very much went back to the book uh, and the original script to put it together, and then they did an amazing job. And G, Jimmy Johnson, the editor as well. Um, I may have that name wrong. But um, the, yeah, and I, 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 having said all that, the interesting thing was I was at Sitges Film Festival for the first time. Um, a month or so ago. This is in Spain. It's huge, um, such as film festival. And Barbie and I were both there for the 30th anniversary of Hellraiser. Uh, we did a and a and then we signed autographs. I was amazed that half the autographs I was signing, in fact, I, I was signing more or less as many Hellraiser as I was Nightbreed autographs. Mm-hmm. Um, people were bringing along Nightbreed posters, which had obviously at some point in their existence been on people's walls, because um, you could still see the sellotape on them and you know mm-hmm. the decaying oh. sellotape on them and so on. So <laughs> I was thinking, you've had this since this came out, uh, yeah. and so on. So it was, yeah, it, it, and I found that absolutely fascinating. But then Spain. 
as this wonderful, wonderful, rich storytelling uh, tradition. And do, they do some amazing films uh, and amazing TV as well. Um, if you ever have a chance to watch a TV program called La Cabina, um, I heartily recommend it. Um, I'm hoping to get a copy of it now because I, I spoke to, I'd seen it back in the 1970s probably on mm. TV. And I was talking, I was explaining this thing to one of the Spaniard, uh, Spanish guys that I met over there. And he just said, yeah, it's La Cabina. It, one of the most important pieces of Spanish TV. It was really, really strange uh, program. So, I uh, yeah. Down. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 but that's the thing about Nightbreed. I know we say, yeah, it's not Clive's vision, but people still love the original movie. Um, mm. You know, it, it, it has a special place in very many people's hearts, particularly gay people, um, because it's all about monsters and being ostracized from from society, I think. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, that's a wonderful movie, Nightbreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great movie. I Yeah, I, I love that movie. I could watch it. Over and over, I can't even count how many times I've seen it. And, <laughs> and same thing with Hellraiser. I mean, I, I can't even count how many times I've seen those movies. You know, I just yeah. something just resonates in those movies that just since, you know, since, it's, it's like good versus evil, and you know, some of it's you know, it's like people may think they're evil, but it's like you know, they're justice. So. Mm. It's like, what is evil, what is good? So, mm -hmm. That's what I was like about the first two. Is um, I don't really think it's still the third one when uh, yeah. they're like portrayed as evil. And I, yeah. I prefer the uh, first two. But um, something since you brought it up about uh, about it being um, important to uh, to gay people, um, mm -hmm. uh, something I don't know about you. Did you ever? Uh, were you always open about uh, about your sexuality, or uh, did you? Cut, was there a certain time you came out? <laughs> That's really, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, well, it depends how far back you want to go. I was, I was more out than Clive was at the time mm -hmm. because I had less to lose. Um, you know, the, it, you have to understand, Neil, I mean, the time at which we were making Nightbreed, well, the time at which we were making Hellraiser is AIDS. Yeah. You know, it's you have to put it, you have to understand that whole thing about your sexuality. Um, I mean, Clive didn't come out for many years, and it was just because he couldn't. You know, it was just, it was suicide, you know, uh, sorry, you know, professional suicide. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, every, you know, my friends, I mean, obviously, I guess, yeah, I mean, I was always out. The, when I actually made the decision, I was out, and that was, I was never going to be, um, it's kind of like I'm not going to try and you know live a lie. I'm not going to try and help it help it for people. Um, I, would, I mean, I was you know people always assumed I was straight anyway, um, which led to complex situations. Um, but it's but again you know I just didn't have as much to lose lose as very very many people. Uh, mm -hmm. No one was interviewing me around about the time of Hellraiser or Nightbreed or anything. No one's inviting me onto TV or anything like that. Yeah. So, you know, and obviously being in a profession where an awful lot of people were gay, um, and it was just completely understood that that was, that, you know. This wasn't talked about. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's just, you either are or you're not, and it's just accepted. Everyone mm -hmm. soon works out who's, you know, um, who's available. Uh, if you like, uh, <laughs> when you if you if you know if you're working on a new show, everyone soon works out who's available in all senses of the word, um, and then you just got on with it. You're there for work and and so on. If there's romantic interest or that's what people got, you know, didn't re doesn't really matter. So I think you know the profession we were in at the time that was the easiest place. But even outside, you know, where I was outside, I would I have always. I never, you know, you just, it was all, I always kind of took the attitude, um, particularly after the, that I was going to be, and that I would always answer a question honestly, and I would always talk about my partner and use, I'd say he, 
mm-hmm. as appropriate, and then not make a thing of it. And just, you know, never actually say, oh, listen, I'm going. You just say, okay, in conversation, well, what's your partner? Okay, you're, oh, yeah, he's at home at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that was the bit, that seemed to be the best way of handling it. If people went, oh, I never, to be honest, I don't recall ever, ever having any real difficulties because mostly people don't mind, mm-hmm. you know, there obviously there are certain bigots and there are always going to be people who want to make a name for saying that we're evil, et cetera, et cetera. There are people who basically like living off hatred because they know they can gain power because hatred is to do with fear. And if you can instill fear in people, then it's really easy to control them and to say that you have a solution to stop so that they, they're no longer afraid. And the easiest way to make sure that people are scared of somebody is to give them a boogeyman. Um, um, so, you know, they're always going to be politicians or TV present. You know, they're always going to be people who can make either money or power grabs from being bigots. Mm-hmm. Um, but most, But outside that world, people on the street, you know, nobody really worries. And I think that's what, you know, that's that's one of the reasons why the laws were changed in 67, uh, 1967 in this country. This year is the is the anniversary of, um, of the uh, sex, I can't remember the name of the act, but basically the decriminalization of male homosexuality in this country mm-hmm. happened in 1967. Um, so, yeah. I think that everybody, I mean, well, not maybe not everybody, but a lot of good portion of the people in the horror community don't care. Mm. Like, oh, good. Just, just don't care. It doesn't matter. It isn't affecting their film that they love, you know? And nobody's going to sit there and be like, gosh, you know, the chatterer is gay. You know, it's, it's not going to affect it in well, no well, way whatsoever at all. Well, actually, you know? of course, and of course, you have now just prompted me and reminded me there's something else I should really mention, and that's volume two Hellraiser volume two. <laughs> there <laughs> Hellraiser you go. Anthology volume two. Which, uh, mm-hmm. um, that's, that's a comic book. The book. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, although I've got um, a pro, I've got a prose story in it. Yeah, so. I'm actually really looking forward to reading that. Yeah, uh, what? it's just got a really nice review um, that was uh, shared on Clive's timeline yesterday uh, on Facebook, really nice, which I just quoted, um, and it, it it deals with that subject head on, um, and. It's really a rather disturbing read. Um, <laughs> from understand, well, from understand, is this the the um, the origin of uh, of yeah, Chatterer? It's the orig- yeah, it's the origin of Chatterer. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. Well, it, yeah, yeah. When you look at like Hellraiser one and two, everybody's basically in bondage wear and <laughs> piercings everywhere, and it's you, you like that. okay, yeah. you're looking like. <laughs> I never know this. I'm glad you told This is basically <laughs> like a leather daddy movie right here, anyways. So, well, it doesn't of, matter to anybody, you know. Well, I did, <laughs> but I thought I thought the point you made earlier on, Mama, about uh, the help, you know, that the horror community is mm-hmm. very much along the line of my my view of the horror community is: listen, we're all weirdos in this together. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. I think. You know that that's that's the thing, which again comes back to night breed. You know, mm-hmm. you know that that thing of being other. It's very accepting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's yeah, it really is, and and I think and people, I'd, I'd be, you know, I've never had any problems, any problems at, at any convention or, or learned about um, uh, or heard about, really. Um, and I think that's a big part of why we all go to conventions, you know, mm. not only is not only is it because we want to 
me are our heroes, you know, things like that. But here we are surrounded by thousands of people just like us, hmm. you know. Even if everyone, it, and some people are different, but you all share the same, uh, the, the love of uh, a common thing. Yeah. Yeah, we all, you know, maybe some people were picked on or what have you. It doesn't matter. We can all come together and this is the one thing we all have in common. Mm. This is one thing we all love, you know, and um, that's one thing I love about cons is that, that it's almost like a sense of one huge family, you know, getting together. Um, and I, I think something like that is just beautiful, you know, so it's yeah, like accepting I- across the board. Yeah, I think the interesting thing is you just suddenly reminded me of uh, George Takei, um, you know, being the middleman between Star him. Trek, and oh, he's wonderful. Mm-hmm. I've, I've met him a couple of times. Well, I've met him once. He's just got the most beautiful speaking voice in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I just um, love him. Lovely man, really, really nice man. But you know, he was saying, that, you know, bringing the Star Trek and Star Wars communities together. Mm-hmm. You don't. I've never. I've. I've not heard of people. Literally, you know, lining up in camps because they're either Freddie or Pinhead fans or something like. That. You don't. You don't. Right. I'm, I'm not aware. Of, I've it's never been be aware. A, yeah. There's going to be a brawl between these. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. People are just, you know, just really deep. And I'm, you know, okay. And I think obviously, I think that's, you know, because you know there are lots of franchises in. Um, and people dress up and, and you know do all this wonderful, wonderful cosplay. Mm-hmm. It's great. I met my first Julia, I think, at Monster Mania. This lady, oh, did, wow. she, she oh, done nice. Julia. I done it really well. Done Julia really, really well. Got you know the blouse and the top and the necklace. They weren't absolutely the, exactly the same, but you knew exactly who she was and what she was doing and and so on. Um, mm-hmm. And I, you know, I love that. I love that. You know, and then occasionally I get to meet chatterers and and so on. And, mm-hmm. uh, so yeah, I I love the fact that you know people are just really accepting of each other. Mhm. It's a beautiful thing. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, I love it. So when's uh when's when's chattering returning? Chattering with Nicholas Vince. Um. It ch- it returns on Sunday. Uh, with yay this coming sunday i've got one two three four there's any time for four more and i literally just got the last guest in place for the last one so there's a couple in november and then there's a couple in december um but ryan andrews ryan m andrews uh is coming on on sunday i've had ryan on before um and uh, we're talking about his uh, latest movie art of obsession um which really looking forward to Ra- ryan's one of those guests actually i off who said something on the show that has always stuck with me and that and he's basically said don't give me your don't tell me your movies you hate the most just tell me the ones you love i am only interested in people's passion mm-hmm. um and i just thought that is such a good attitude. That is, you know, if you if you don't like something, fine. If somebody says, "What did you think of it?" I'm not asking you to lie, right? But it, you know, <laughs> you know, if you, yeah. there's no need to go online and just trash everybody, uh, everything. Uh, you ask, yeah, yeah um, unless it's a deeply offensive or you really want to stop people wasting their money. Up, you know, it, sure. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, just. Just concentrate on the thing that you you know share what you love. Yeah, and I thought you know that that's so. I, I I was really looking forward to the chance of getting Andrew to come back on again. Ashley yeah. Thorpe's coming on. Oh, um, cool. I've got Lee Howard, who's the uh, guy behind. I can't remember. I'm going to get the name of his uh, of the teddy bear. He's an artist, um, and. Uh, and I just bear with me whilst I, I think about it. The other late, there's a late, and whilst I'm looking that up, uh, just had it confirmed uh, just before I came on sh- on the show, a lady called uh, Tinny Ullman, who is um, have I got her surname wrong? I think I've probably got her surname wrong. 
um, she basically made a film called Freddy Eddie, which is a German language film. So you have to watch it in subtitles. Um, and she is coming up. Sorry, it's The Quiet Room Bears by Lee, Lee Howard, okay. um, which are these basically these um, teddy bears, which he does with his one offs. Uh, yeah. And he recently did uh, a whole load of Hellraiser ones. Um, but basically, they're just deeply, deeply disturbing teddy bears. Um, I love it. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah, no, Tony did it, this movie called Freddy Eddie, which I saw at Fright Fest, uh, at, at our big London show, and um, she just uh, confirmed that she can come on at the end of uh, the month as well. And Freddy Eddie, I just want to, I know it's Tinny. Tinny Tullman, not Ullman. I knew I got that wrong. Tinny Ullman. Um, Freddie finds himself in the biggest crisis of his life because he gets accused of having beaten up his wife. Whilst his world collapses, Eddie, his t childhood imaginary friend, reappears. Uh, he loses control. Uh, yes. What is a big support for him in the, in the beginning turns out to be the greatest the worst horror he loses control over eddie and nobody believes him that it is not him doing all the atrocities how to prove someone who used to be a product of your imagination is alive and it's a brilliant movie that one's that one's sitting in a eight eight point five on uh, oh wow yeah yeah <laughs> it's um and uh, yeah I, the, uh, uh, and it's amazing, an amazing central performance by the uh, central uh, actor Felix Schaffer um, as well. So, uh, yeah, Tini Tulman is, uh, is coming on the show. So, yeah, so we've got, uh, I'm so pleased because it's been ages since I've been able to do a chattering. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. I, to, I just have to say, I looked up these quiet room bears and I'm looking at the Hellraiser ones now and they are awesome. I see the, the chatterer one right now is pretty yeah. sweet with the, with the teeth right in the middle and this. All of them are awesome. I like I like the skinless. Uh, I don't know if he's Frank or not. But I like the skinless bit. All of them are very cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he does. He do, basically he does these as one offs, and then I think they you know he puts them up online and they they get auctioned off. Um, but he also does these wonder, this wonderful black and white art artwork as well. Uh, he's a painter as well. Yes, um, he has uh, his Pennywise one's amazing. He has a yes. display picture. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. No, Lee, Lee's a really interesting guy. So I'm, I'm, re um, I'm really looking forward to. But also, that, funnily enough, what I'm also doing the, with these new because a slight change of format going forward as well. So rather than just speaking to filmmakers about their films, I'm asking them which two films most influenced either that particular film or mm. their career that's um, interesting yeah it's because it's because it, it's, it's, often and you must find this as well is that people won't have had the chance to see the film which you're talking uh, right and it's always interesting to you know discover about things um but it, it's kind of like okay well if we're talking about influences then more people can and because of you know, my shows are always live um mm -hmm. so I want to be able to involve as many people as possible so people can have a chance of, of looking at those shows and those films and, and perhaps ask some questions about what, you know, what they're... So, uh, yeah, so a slight change in, in the format. I like that, yeah. Uh, to, to put that on yourself, what, 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 would, what would be your two? Oh, Mask of the Red Death, Roger Corman's Mask of Fantastic the Red Death. Movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, that's definitely... I mean, it's going to be all the Roger Corman's... Um, Mask of the Red Death, Pit and the Pendulum, uh, Fall of the House of Usher. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, th those, those, those are things. Um, yeah, films which I found terribly, terribly disturbing. Are things like Peeping Tom, um, which is a, real, and of course the other big influence is Hitchcock. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's I love the way that Hitchcock takes normal situations and just twists them. Um, and it, 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 like the man who, and, and it's often on just one moment, one split decision. I'm thinking of the man who knew too much. 
Um, it's just that one moment. Um, and in uh, North by Northwest, a complete, which is simply a case of mistaken identity, mm-hmm. um, from which this, you know, a simple case of mistaken identity. Um, and, you know, that, that timing had to be, you know, so, so, yeah, I mean, Hitchcock's the master. How can you not be influenced by Hitchcock? Um, so, yeah, I think somewhere those, and if, if I had to choose a Hitchcock, probably The Birds. Although I always found the ending of The Birds slightly dissatisfying. There's, funnily enough, that's... There's, you know, coming back to the like whispered, it's not all explained. Right. Um, the, the short story, funnily enough, that on which uh, the birds is placed, the Daphne du Maurier short story, ends in a very similar fashion. It's never explained why this, the, the birds suddenly attack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's incredibly effective, though. Um, it, it, you know, it's du Maurier. She writes, you know, she's a wonderful, wonderful writer. Um, so yeah, so Hitchcock, probably Hitchcock, Corman, and uh, you know this guy called Clive Barker. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, sure. that, that, well, yeah, <laughs> I mean seriously, that's the great thing about the 30th anniversary is I've attended a few screenings of Hellraiser. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. since I'm making movies, I sit and watch it in a completely different way. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, you know, I literally sit there and look at the editing. I look at the lighting. I look at the way it's put. You know, he's put the shot together. How he moves the camera. Um, it's a great masterclass in filmmaking. Hellraiser. Mm-hmm. You know, about you know the, all the visuals, etc. But just the simple filmmaking and the way they use. You know, and, and obviously a lot of that has to do with uh, Robin Vision and the DOP. Um, but yeah. So yes, I, I could never not say how Clive, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I was. It was uh, when I watched him again when we did uh, Hellraiser Month, which was the first time we we talked to you was a few years ago, mm. and I watched them all again. And it was like, um, I just think usually if you think of horror, you think of like red, but there's uh, the Hellraiser. There's a lot of blues in the movie. Yes, and also you see the monsters. They're not in the shadows. Mm-hmm. You see, you see them front and center a lot of the time. You know, obviously they're teased at the very beginning, but when Chatra makes his entrance, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of blues, um, a very cold color. Yeah, there's definitely yeah. very true, it, it isn't it? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's like, um, like you said, cold. It seems it's got like death, I guess, because uh, yes. you know, you'd be drained of color, you'd be blue. Yes. But yes, because the rest of the, whenever you're, you know, yeah. The, and then, it, it, then it's an also nice contrast with, uh, with the reds of blood. Yes. Yes. And the, yes, I just, I'm now replaying like that hospital scene is almost entirely blue until you see the blood coming up into the, um, uh, the thing that's got liquid hanging off a drip. Intravenous drip is the word I'm looking for. Um, the blood <laughs> coming up against the blue. It is blue, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, it's very heavy and blue. Mm-hmm. It's grey. Yeah, but it's grey when you're in the labyrinth. It's predominantly mm-hmm. blue when you're on the hospital scene. When they appear, their skin tones are all blue, of course. Yeah. Uh, apart from Cheshire. But Doug's is very blue. A few more Cenobites is very blue. Grey. Butterball and Cheshire are more flesh-toned, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, predom- no, you're absolutely right. It, I'd not thought of that. Yeah, good spot. I like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, it was just something I didn't notice. I pro- well, I guess if you're a kid watching something, you don't really notice the lighting so much. But when you're watching, uh, when I was you know later in life, it's something I picked up. Yeah, no, and and, and it's, as I say, it, you know, for me, it is just absolutely fascinating to look at when Julia brings the first victim home. She literally stands between light and dark. It's all shot in silhouette, and she hesitates in the light, which kind of influence comes back to the night whispered when i talk about traveling from light into darkness mm-hmm. um which these characters do um julia is hesitates uh with the first victim as to whether or not she is going to do that you know may, is she really going to do 
how much does she really love Frank? Mm-hmm. I think with age, like, I think there's three major things that I, I really notice in film now. A, it's the, the lighting. Two, it's the, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, I really look towards, like, the cinematography, um, you know, the whole scene, not just, you know, one part, but the whole scene. And and lately, for like the last year, product placement. I don't know why, but every single time I watch a movie, I'm like, oh, product placement. Like, yeah, okay. it's really interesting, you know, isn't it? it? It's, been, it's been getting really bad, like really hardcore. Like I'll be sitting there and she, you know, she whips out her Maybelline compact and it's like, do, do, do. But all you see is Maybelline or a Pepsi or whatever. And I'm just like, product placement. Well, I, was you know? watched, I watched Gremlins uh, the other day and it's like Burger King. Uh-huh. <laughs> it goes into Burger King, but you see it in the background of the shot, really front and center as he walks down the street. Uh, oh, yeah. the street you know, like, oh, yeah, Burger King. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It's, and it just seems to get more and more prevalent. And I'm just like, I understand needing more money to help make a film. I get it. I totally get it. It's on TV okay. as well. It's, it's, it's yeah. The cars and the sat navs and oh well, you only have to all you have to do is speak to say where you want to go mm-hmm. in the car. Well, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and you do feel I feel really sorry for the writers and the you know everybody involved. It just has yeah. to like, try and make that work <laughs> um, yeah. and make it not add Coca Cola here. You know, yeah. it must be bad. Yeah. It must be hard for a period piece or like a in medieval medieval times. I don't know. <laughs> like a, yes. I don't know. What put <laughs> yeah. yeah, no one makes historical dramas because <laughs> I'll do product <laughs> Uh, uh, Would you uh, like uh, mead or Pepsi mead? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, I'm guessing you don't get much product placement in Game of Thrones. I was uh, thinking the exact same thing. I was, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> so I also understand that you're you have a you have a shop coming up. Yeah, I mean, this is something I've been planning for a while. Um, so it's still kind of a very early stages, and hopefully it comes out um, in the next couple of weeks if all goes according to plan. Um, it, I'm not quite sure of the format, but basically I've been interested in graphic design um, and, and art and for years and years and years and years. Um, so I thought, I, you know, what well, I've got some ideas and probably some cartoons. Uh, to begin with, and I'll be putting those up on Red Bubble, uh, and that's the plan. That's the plan in the next couple of weeks. Um, mm-hmm. uh, certainly, hopefully, yeah, mid November. So you might be able to sneak in some very last minute Christmas uh, gift T-shirts uh, gifts <laughs> if it all goes. If it all goes, yeah, if it all goes to plan. I mean, like everything else in my life, I was supposed to be on top of this a month ago, um, but that mm-hmm. didn't happen. Uh, yeah. So I know yeah. the feeling. <laughs> I have something very big I've been working on, I think, for a year, and Nicholas yeah. knows all about it. But, but uh, when it when it when it's announced, it'll be very big. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it'll be cartoons. And it's just kind of like some silly ideas I've got for cartoons. And I thought, well, okay, if I find them funny, other people might find them funny, and therefore they might want to put them on a t-shirt or exactly. or something. You know, you never know. It's until I try, you never know. Um, exactly. Yeah. I'm yeah. Yeah. We have a little something on the horizon too, so we're just like, oh, hopefully, you can get out before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so. You want to get that Christmas market if you can. You do want to get that Christmas, Christmas market. market. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That Christmas market. Yeah. Get it. That's awesome that you're doing the Red Bubble Shop. That's. I mean, it's a cool name. Um, how did you come up with the name for it? I oh, think Red that's Bubble. a website. Yeah. Yeah, Redbubble is a website. Redbubble uh... is a, it's an existing. So basically all I have to do is to load my designs on and then they will sort out all the t shirts. At, and they basically they print on there are a number of websites that do do this. Redbubble is the one that I'm familiar with and 
uh, it seems to be the, the biggest and the most popular. So, mm-hmm. um, and there are people doing, you know, horror related stuff and, uh, on there. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, okay, fine, I'm going to have a go. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and so on. So we'll, we'll see. Um, that is the plan. Um, and I'm definitely working towards it. Um, and but funny enough, you may have heard a, t- a ding whilst I was um, uh, whilst we were talking, and that's um, me being chased for, on another project, <laughs> <laughs> which, which will be a short film. Um, for uh, yeah, I, I, I just uh, 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 now yeah. he's just talking in tongues now i think yeah 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 <laughs> um, yeah you are a very very it's, busy man i am a very bit well I, I, it's like december the 15th uh is my deadline uh, and oh i think i'm wow. going to be a, i think i'm going to be able to do it with everything else that's come you know it's, yeah i should should be able to do that but um it's basically it's for um uh Oh, how much can I say? No, oh, no, I'm sure that, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure everyone, yeah, no, because they put up public. It's for Jen and Sylvia, for the uh, Jen and Sylvia Soska's Women in Horror Month. Blood oh, Guide. okay. Uh, I'm going to do another short film. But it's like, okay, they said, can you do a short film? Yes. How do I make a short film with no budget, no money, no access, you know, no time? Okay, I'm going to do it in a style in which I know I can do it. Um which is basically using posable action figures, uh, <laughs> which I'm is a great part. Yeah, except I lost a, a member of my cast has got lost in the post, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> which is a lot. It's like I remember I posted it. It's like really, really. It's like okay. I mean, I wasn't intending. Um, cameras aren't intending to roll on that until right. end of November, <laughs> beginning of December. Um, uh-huh. Um, I still got to write the script here. I've got the outline. I knew what I know what's going to happen, um, and I and I did a very interesting poll on Facebook asking for people's favourite chat up lines, um, which is all integral to the script. So that's all right, and I'm I'm conf- I'm confident I can do it. Um, I just need to get some actor friends in to do to record some dialogue some voices. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just need to get some uh, some actor friends into, so we'll we'll give them lunch and so on. Yeah, and, uh, I, I, I know you you did some lip you did a lot of lip syncing for their last uh, uh, video. Yes. Uh, last year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they're not asking me to do that this time. Or they're not asking me to do that. basically oh. asking for short films. Oh, right. um, and uh, it, it's yeah. Um, and it's like, okay, you want to see me? Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing them next weekend. I really need to have got a lot further by the time I see them next weekend. I think. Um, no, no, it's it, it's all fine. I don't. I had actually mentioned it to them that when I last saw them, I thought well, I may have trouble here hitting that deadline. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I want to. I want to get it done. I call out from anything else. I want to have Christmas off. <laughs> really looking forward. I'm really I'll be looking forward. Crossing my fingers for you. Thank you. Thank you. It's nothing to do with crossing fingers. Well, yeah, luck. Crossing fingers, sending good wishes. Thank you very much, Mama. Much I, luck. I, I, it's, <laughs> I know, I'm grateful. I know last time I saw you was in uh, Rhode Island, mm. and I believe you were working on a lot of deals, which may probably some projects we just talked about at the time. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think so. yeah. I mean, well, yes, because I mean, basically, when was Rhode Island? It was at the beginning of the year, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like March, I think. Maybe. February. Yeah. So I mean, basically, I was just I was working on my Kickstarter for the two short films then, mm-hmm. um, and plus I knew that I had Book of Monsters coming up um, then. So uh, yeah, I mean, there are there are there are some other. I should be acting in at least. If all goes well, I should be acting in at least another couple of uh, feature films um, next year, at the beginning of next year. I'm just waiting for dates to be. I've seen scripts. I'm just waiting for um, confirmation of shooting dates. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and just hoping that they don't clash. They shouldn't clash. Um, there's only yeah. a, they're only like a day. You know, that's mostly what I do is like a day. Uh, on the, it's great because I get to play featured roles. Um, mm-hmm. So that you, most of my stuff can be done in a day, so that's yeah, that's fine. Yeah, uh, 
Mm. So, you know, which allows me to do other stuff. Although, you know, hey, if somebody wants to cast me in the lead in a feature film, I'm not going to say no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, so oh, no, I'll be, please I'll... don't give me work. <laughs> please, don't, don't pay me. No. Don't pay me to work. <laughs> that does depend on the scripts. Having said that, that right, does depend right. on the I do yeah, turn yeah. down a lot. Yeah, I do turn, t- mm-hmm. turn down stuff. Turn town stuff. Turn down stuff. Um, so, but yeah, so there is always that provisor as well. But yeah, there is a couple <laughs> of really cool, interesting projects uh, next year which I'm looking forward to being part of. Um, right. Oh, yeah. So, how do people find Nicholas Vince online? How do people find Nicholas Vince online? Yeah. I, yeah, I suggest you can go to my newly restructured website, www.nicholasvince.com. Yeah. Um, and as I say that, that probably means I probably need to revise it again. No, it's up to it's <laughs> uh, Definitely, you can find me at www.nicholasvince.com. Um, you can find me if you Google, if you uh, search for Nicholas Vince uh, on Facebook. You'll get two, two choices. One is Nicholas Berman Vince, and one is Nicholas Vince. Um, I'm probably more active on the Nicholas Berman Vince one at the moment, but I'm trying to get back on top of the Nicholas Vince one because uh, some people just like to f- like you rather than friend you, and I totally yeah. See, you know, so there's yeah. those two choices there. Um, I go for the Berman Vince. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's where you'll mostly find me uh, mm-hmm. posting and stuff. But I do try and yeah. so, But if you find, yeah, you go there, you'll be able to find out what's uh, that, yeah, what's going on. And, you know, if you find friend me on Facebook, I, I like friends. I, it's nice. It's always nice having a friend. Um, you will see, you know, wake up in the morning. What do you mean I've got no friend requests to deal with? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's, again, the horrible thing of, like, when I've, you know, it's like when I was working really in the thick of doing all the, um, the post production on the two short films, I think I didn't actually accept a friend request request for like three or four weeks. So when I got to do it, I had about thirty or forty to go through, and I think, <laughs> oh, right, that's, that's very it's, exciting. Yeah. yeah, it's really nice, and I, you know, I love it. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's all, I, you know, I, I was fascinated by the people who you know, approached me and, and asked us to be friends. Because you you get to meet the most interesting people, um, but uh, yeah. So then you get this lull after you think, oh no, what have I done wrong? People don't like. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, come on, come be, be my friends on Facebook. Being friends is nice. it is very nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it's always a pleasure to have you on. It's always Thank it's always like so to talk much. to you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's always a pleasure to let you. You know, for you to let me ramble on uh, as I usually do. <laughs> no, it's really nice and lovely to meet you, Mama. Um, oh yes, it's so nice to actually talk to you. And uh, this is my first time not being a listener and actually getting to talk to you. So, um, yes. Brilliant, and congratulations! I mean, and well done on your show, Neil. I mean, I'm always in, always in awe of, of your. How like, how long have you been going now? Uh, 12 years. So next year is actually the 13th year. So you should do something Lucky special to think for that. Yeah. Lucky 13. And how many episodes have you done? I'm not positive on that. I'd have to, uh, I probably should keep track of that, but, uh, yeah. but, there, but there's a lot. I will say the, the first few years, it wasn't as regular. So it yeah. wasn't, uh, it wasn't weekly or anything. It was kind of, uh, whenever I could find someone to talk to, but, yeah. uh, but the last few years it's been every week. So. Uh, sometimes more than once a week. So yeah. right. a lot, a lot, a lot of guests. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Uh, you know, when I do look at the guest list and I do kind of think, wow, there's a lot of people. <laughs> well, it is. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 mean I, crazy. I mean, I, you're way past the milestone I hit, which was a hundred shows uh, a couple of months ago. And it's, it, yeah, it's extraordinary what you guys have done. It really is amazing. I'm so full of awe for without your head. So, Make sure you listen, folks. Otherwise, the chatterer will come and get you. <laughs> there you That's cool. Hi there, this is Barbie Wilde, and I'm best known for playing the female Cenobite in Hellbound Hellraiser 2 and for being the writer of The Venus Complex and Voices of the Damned. You're listening to Without Your Head.